So welcome to everybody. And we'll just give another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll start off. This is brilliant. We have over 200 people attending so far. So we'll get started. You're very welcome to AWARE's monthly webinar series. And this month it's Let's Talk About Menopause. I'm personally really excited about this. And uh, just very, about two, three years ago, I had conversations with my friends, my female friends, that nobody was talking about menopause, nobody. And we were talking about things that we were each experiencing and going, how come we didn't know that? How come we didn't know that? And as any of you who've been listening to the radio over the last four or five days would know, the whole country seems to be talking about menopause. So we in AWARE are really thrilled to welcome Dr. Quiva Hartley, who is a GP and a menopause specialist. And I've been doing my best to hold back <laughs> this conversation. I wanted to start it 15 minutes ago when Quiva and I were starting to talk about it. So we're going to hand it over to Quiva. We want to thank you very, very much for those of you who sent in questions in advance. We've had an enormous response to this webinar, way bigger than any of our other webinars. And it just really talks to the, the desire for us as women to talk about menopause and to find out about it. So we've had lots of questions. We've categorized them into different areas. Quiva has seen them in advance and she's going to gear her conversation towards those questions. If you'd like to ask questions during, the during this webinar, please do, but we might not answer them specifically if Creve is already going to address them. So, and there might be too many for us to address individually. So please, if you are left at the end of this with questions, please talk to your GP, or if you'd like to follow up with, with Dr. Hartley, you're welcome to, 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 to her clinic. So, for those of you who are new to the webinars, my name is Claire Hayes. I'm Clinical Director with AWARE. AWARE is Ireland's national organisation to support people who have depression or bipolar disorder. We offer free services and they range from support groups to life skills courses to groups to support people who are worried about family members who have depression. And there is an incredibly brilliant website aware.ie, which has lots of resources on supporting people with depression and menopause. And it's no coincidence that AWARE is hosting Let's Talk About Menopause, because as Quiva will, will talk about, mental health is really important. And there are people who are experiencing depression. And one of the questions we got is, how do, we know if I'm ex how do I know if I'm experiencing depression or how do I know if it's menopause? So with that as a kickoff question, and I don't expect you to answer that one straight away, Quiva, and I'm happy to come back later on in the conversation and address that if you'd like. But I'd like you to introduce yourself if you would, and we're thrilled, absolutely thrilled to have you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Claire and Jamie and, and the whole team at Aware. I think it's brilliant that you're doing this and great to see some light shed on this. It's fantastic. So I'm Dr. Kiva Hartley. Um, so I'm a GP, I trained here in Ireland. Um, I did my uh, specialist training in women's health and menopause while I was living in Canada. I lived in Alberta for just over five years and I moved home to Ireland in 2019, just ahead of the pandemic, thankfully. Um, and now I've set up my own uh, clinic here in we're based in Dawkey and it's called Menopause Health. And I'm really dedicated and passionate about um, helping women, especially um, with uh, hormonal issues, particularly perimenopause and, and menopause. And here we are. Brilliant. Well, look, I'm going to hide myself on screen and I'm going to hand it over to you and to, this is your time. Okay, well, I think I might kick off by going through the mountain of questions that we had. I mean, it's fantastic and it really shows you how I think one of the issues is finding information. Menopause is such a tricky area because you can Google things, obviously, but it's so individual. So it's quite hard to get an answer for you. And I think the amount of questions that we've, you know, that we've had in response to this does really speak to the fact that like people are struggling to get reliable, like credible information. So like 
at a really simplistic level, if we're just going to start by talking about like what is menopause, what's actually happening? And a lot of people might have heard the term perimenopause be used a lot, especially in the last week. Um, so we might talk a bit about that as well. So what happens is, I suppose, in a normal cycle, in a normal reproductive cycle for women, you have hormones that are sort of going gently bobbing up and down. You get a rise in estrogen and then and then estrogen and progesterone. And then towards the end of your cycle, they fall and you get a, a bleed or a period if you haven't had a, a pregnancy happen. Um, and somewhere in on average in your 40s, although it varies much, very much from woman to woman, but um, that starts that pattern, that gentle sort of bobbing up and down sort of changes. And what we start to see is a change or fluctuation in the production of these hormones. So your ovaries, which are normally producing estrogen, progesterone and testosterone, they start to produce maybe a little bit less. You get a dip and your brain is in constant communication with your ovaries. It's called your neuroendocrine system. It talks to your ovaries. So your brain is aware of this. God, we've had this dip in this hormone. And it decides to sort of shout at your ovaries for want of a better way of describing it sort of you know or a kick up the ovaries like it's telling you look you need to work a bit harder produce more of these hormones we're running out and your ovaries do but they overcompensate so instead of being in this little zone where you're bobbing up and down all of a sudden you get you know much bigger rises and falls in hormones so again that happens in an erratic pattern you might be okay for a few months and then all of a sudden this happens again and that's perimenopause it's just this roller coaster of overproduction underproduction and maybe a normal amount for a while. And the symptoms you might see, so number one, you might notice a change in the pattern of your period. So maybe they're not as regular, maybe they get further apart, maybe they're a bit heavier for some women. You can actually get what's called uh, a loop event, which basically is you get one cycle tr like um, transposed on top of another cycle. So you ovulate very in kind of close succession. You can get two periods very close together. Um, so bleeding can really be an issue. Um, but one of the big issues is mood um, and emotional symptoms, and they tend to be worse during this roller coaster. Because when you get to menopause and you're not producing these hormones at all, you're deficient, so you're below a line, you're not producing much, but at least you're stable. So at least from a mood perspective, you're often, not always, but often better when you're postmenopausal for that reason. Perimenopause, we see a lot of PMS type symptoms, irritability, some people even describe like a rage panic attacks for the first time ever, anxiety, um, and often crippling, like I've spoken to women who have to give up their jobs, who can't thrive anymore because of this anxiety. Certain things can make people more at risk of that. So if you have a history of very bad PMS, if you have a history of um, postnatal depression, for example, or you, if you just have a history of pre-existing um, mental health issues, so if you've had depression or anxiety in the past, you might be slightly more um, likely to have those issues as you go through perimenopause. Um, some physical symptoms can happen at that time, but they're less common. So really what we're talking about is this PMS type of situation in perimenopause. Then your period stop. If you go 12 full months, but no period, so, sorry, you are postmenopausal. Just, sorry, yeah. just before you go into the postmenopause, can I just ask you, because one of the questions that we've had is, when does perimenopause start? So you were saying in the 40s, but then there were some so, questions so, about people mm. in their 30s. So it can start at any at any age, technically. The average age for your final period to happen is 51. And the average age for your periods to start changing their pattern or regularity is probably somewhere around the age of 45. Early menopause is under the age of 40. Uh, sorry, early menopause is under the age of 45. That's about 5% of women. And premature menopause is under 40, and that's about 1% of women. But some women might find, probably because of genetic factors, that they just notice these changes earlier on, like in their 30s, for example, and they might be perimenopausal, so producing erratic amounts of hormones for a much longer time than the person who notices those symptoms happen at 47. It's a spectrum. It's really, really individual. That's what, so that's part of what makes it so challenging. You know, from my perspective, that's what takes the time is to go through and then tease out like what's hormonal and what's not hormonal, what's pandemic, what's, you know, um, environmental factors and so on what's other biological factors. But um, so in terms of the questions we've had, so I think um, one of the common symptoms that uh, people are maybe aware of with menopause is hot flushes and night sweats. Um, I'm sorry, I, inter I interrupted you there. So before you go to that, because <laughs> you were saying about the perimenopause and then yeah. you were going to describe what the menopause is. So, uh, so essentially just you're not producing these hormones. So your ovaries stop ovulating. You're not going to produce an egg anymore. You don't um, so you don't ovulate once a month, and because of that, your 
ovaries will produce still a small amount of testosterone for most women, but no estrogen and progesterone from the ovaries. And then there's a kind of knock on effect of that. So you get physical symptoms and mood and emotional symptoms and vaginal and urinary symptoms because of that happening. So the physical symptoms, um, so as I say, your hot flushes in life, that's the ones that most people like classically think of. Um, and we can maybe talk about that in a sec. There are other physical symptoms. And unfortunately, the sort of bad news is that it can affect you pretty much like, you know, top of your head, bottom of your toes type thing and, and everything in between because we have estrogen receptors everywhere. We have estrogen receptors in our brain. We have estrogen receptors in our mouth. We have estrogen receptors, obviously, in breast tissue, our bowels, our heart our entire vascular system are, you know, we use estrogen to make collagen, glycogen, things that are important for lubrication of your joints and, and so on. And, and even like the health of your skin and hair is all affected. So um, joint aches and pains are not uncommon in menopause. People can get, um, you know, itchy or dry skin. They might notice a change in their hair. Um, you can obviously have fatigue. Migraines get a lot more common. There's actually a lot of questions about migraines. It'd be nice to, to talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, Vaginal symptoms, really common, not talked about as much as they should be. So like the majority of women will get vaginal symptoms, 70, 80% of women will have vaginal symptoms at some point in their life. Um, they could, often could, happen- could you, Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting across you again, so apologies, but could oh, you I just don't. explain when you say vaginal <laughs> symptoms, and I know you'll come back to that, but just for, <laughs> for people who are listening right now, what, what do you mean by that? So, so again, so it's sort of, it's individual. Okay. Yeah, it's individual. So some people will get more sort of dryness and they might find like really what's happening is estrogen is this kind of really important hormone that you're not making as much of anymore. And vaginally, what you need it for is for a couple of things. You need it to make a substance called glycogen. And glycogen is a large part of our vaginal environment. It changes the tissue in our um, vaginal walls. It affects the pH of the vaginal environment. So when those things change, we see the vaginal walls getting thinner so imagine it going from sort of like a spongy piece of foam to more like crepe paper almost. Oh, wow. And we lose the folds that happen on the inside. So vaginal tissue should have a lot of stretch and elasticity for childbirth and intercourse and all these things. So, and it loses that. So if you do a vaginal exam on someone who is very, you know, postmenopausal, it looks smooth when it should look, it should look like an accordion almost. So you lose that give and stretch, it gets thinner, it loses its blood supply. So that kind of contributes to um, the walls thinning out a little bit. And the pH changes. So the pH changing, it affects the microbiome. So it affects the type of bacteria and different organisms that occupy, that live in our vaginal region that should live there. But we just see different types of microorganisms living there because of this change in pH, because of the loss of, of estrogen. So all of that leads to dryness less lubrication, it can be itchy and uncomfortable. Painful sex is really common. Sometimes tearing and fissures and bleeding with sex can be common. And urinary symptoms, so things like needing to pee frequently, um, a loss of control, so incontinence, sometimes for the first time in someone's life, um, and recurrent urinary infections can be common too. So they're the kind of vaginal urinary symptoms that I'd be talking about. Okay. So, so we've talked about perimenopause and menopause. And does menopause stop at a certain time and all of these symptoms suddenly go away or are we stuck with it forever? What do you think? Yes and no. So yes, in the sense that for most women, the really dominating physical symptoms, so things like hot flushes will have a shelf life. And on average, depending on what research you're reading, it's anything from five years to maybe nine or 10, but it's somewhere in that region. It's much longer than we kind of um, would be aware of, I think. So so commonly it's about six or seven years would be average to have hot flushes and night sweats. Um, and, but some of the other physical symptoms, so say for example, vaginal dryness, the change in your skin, change in your hair, you never get that estrogen back. So that's lifelong. And, and actually vaginal atrophy tends to just get worse as time goes on. Whereas some of the other symptoms like hot flushes tend to get better with time. And then about 10 or 15% of women, they're gonna have symptoms for the rest of their life, unfortunately. Okay, so I'm <laughs> so if you go back then to the questions that you want to pick up on that, that we've got, and I know they're, they're about particular symptoms, and obviously we can't address individual questions, but there were so many, we were able to pull them together in themes. So what do you think I've, would be most helpful for people watching? Yeah, I, well, I don't know. I'll make a stab at it. I've loosely categorized them. So um, 
I thought maybe t like talking about hot flushes just since they're so common like and I get asked a lot like what causes what are they like what causes them so I could make up some answer and why are you with science but in truth in truth we don't know so, so we don't understand the pathophysiology like we don't understand what's happening and what causes hot flushes we have theories but we don't know for sure and one of the theories is that basically with this drop in estrogen that you get a change in your thermoregulatory zone. So basically imagine like your thermostat in the house and you have it set between, you know, well, when it goes below this level and above this level, my, you know, heating system is going to kick in or whatever. So you have that in your hypothalamus and your part of your brain is responsible. It's your kind of inner thermostat and it starts to misbehave. And, and we don't understand what, like why that is. We know that estrogen contributes, but we don't know what else is feeding into that. Um, but essentially, you go from sort of living in this zone and your, your hypothalamus or your brain is happy bobbing you along in this zone. It'll cool you down if you go above here. It'll warm you up if you go below here. It narrows. And so all of a sudden, it starts to think that you're really, really hot when you're not. And so it, it, it sort of inappropriately tries to cool you down. And it does this by making all your blood vessels kind of rush to the surface and open up. And with that, you often get a surge in almost like adrenaline. You get part of your nervous system that kind of switches on at the same time. And this might resonate with women who feel a lot of women would describe getting almost anxious when they have a hot flush. They get this horrible, like fluttery, sometimes palpitations. It's really awful. It can be really uncomfortable. So when those blood vessels do their thing and you try to get rid of that heat, um, you get this essentially a flush, just like the name suggests. And then after a few minutes, you start to get cold for most women. So because it has inappropriately dropped your temperature and then you're Baltic, you're freezing. And so if you're in bed at night and this is happening, you have the covers on, you throw the covers off, you put the covers back on, you throw the covers off and you just do that all night and you don't get any good quality restorative sleep, which is yet another symptom of perimenopause and menopause. And we'll definitely talk about sleep because, again, it's one of the huge things that women come to me about. So um, there are other hormones implicated in kind of what creates hot flushes. What else do I want to say about hot flushes? There's 70 to 80 percent of women. They can be really debilitating. Um, um, some women don't get them at all. And that's OK to not have them. They tend to peak uh, about a year after your final period. So you might find you get them before your period stop. But like, be warned, they might get worse and they're going to peak somewhere about 12 months after your last period. And then they, you know, should start to abate and get better. Um, they can be worse than people who smoke. So just something to bear in mind. Alcohol and caffeine for some women are a trigger for hot flushes. So just reduce them. And then like they talk about, you know, wearing cotton clothes and co or cool clothes and being in a cool environment as much as possible. So you can do all of those things. But the best treatment for Hot flushes by far is estrogen, so hormone therapy. There are other non-hormonal medications that we will cover later, but um, but the most effective treatment is estrogen, you know, by far. Well, well as you know from the questions, we've got so many questions about HRT, so yep. I think we'll be coming to that. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Okay. What else did I pick out? Oh, migraine. Might be worth talking about migraine a little bit. It is, it is really common. So. So migraine headaches, from a general practice perspective, if I'm talking to someone and I'm taking a history about their headache and I'm trying to figure out is this a tension headache, is it a migraine headache, is it something else? So migraines classically, they come and go, they're paroxysmal, so they come and go. Um, they're usually unilateral, although not always. They're usually happening on one side, so all down the right side or all down the left. Um, they can be accompanied by something called an aura, which, you know, again, some people might be familiar with. Yeah. That's often visual, um, but it can be, um, you can get like motor aura where you lose power, you can get sensory aura where you get a change in sensation. And basically this is just a change in a sensory function. So with the visual aura, typically you might, I've had visual aura, it's the scariest thing. And even I knew what it was and I was terrified. Yeah. I, so you lose like part of your vision, Well, this is what happened to me anyway. And, and then like these bright jaggedy lights and then it got bigger and bigger. Um, and I sort of had to sit down and I, yeah, like there, it's, I think it's, I think migraine with aura is terrifying. And then it passes usually after about 30 minutes. And then you might be accompanied by a headache then afterwards. Um, so what we know, I suppose, about um, migraine in the context of hormones is that it's really common. And a lot of women will describe this pattern of like, I get a menstrual migraine. So a couple of days before my period, onset of headache, I might have it for a few days and then it goes away. Those women, unfortunately, are higher risk to have their migraines get kind of severe or worse as they go through perimenopause. And if you go back to my little like, you know, you were doing this 
and now you're doing this. So obviously much bigger fluctuations in these hormones are going to drive those migraines a little bit more. And we think it's driven by changes in estrogen levels. That's what triggers them. So big kind of fluctuations of estrogen means more migraines, unfortunately. Um, uh, that's called the estrogen withdrawal hypothesis, if you want to put a big fancy science name on it. So basically, as you're losing estrogen, your vascular system seems to respond by producing this migraine. Um, what else? Uh, hormone therapy, when it comes to migraine, can actually increase migraines a little, so just something to be aware of. But one question I get asked all the time is that women who have migraine or women with migraine with aura have been told they can't take the pill. And that is true. So if you're a woman over 35 and you get any type of migraine or at any age, if you get migraine with aura, you're really not someone who should be taking the combined oral contraceptive pill. So the normal standard pill. And the reason is because of that increased risk of stroke that we see in women on the pill with a history of migraine. Um, that is not true for HRT. And so there's big differences between birth control and hormone therapy, even though they sound similar they're kind of similar hormones. There's actually big differences. And because with hormone therapy, if you get estrogen through your skin, so if you get dermal estrogen, it doesn't have an impact on clotting factors. We can go through this in a minute when we're talking more about HRT, but basically there isn't an increased risk of stroke with estrogen through your skin. And so it's safe for women who have a history of migraine. Um, they might just see an initial like small increase in how frequent their migraines are when they start that should settle with time. Um, so, and there's a few other factors maybe that come into it, but just to be aware, yeah. So HRT, you are a candidate for a certain type of hormone therapy if you have a history of migraines. And then I always recommend there's other treatments like anti-inflammatories and um, tryptans, they're called, they're often used. You just take them if you need them, if you have a migraine. So it's worth looking, exploring other options too for treating migraine. Okay, will I keep going or do you want to yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Look, this, is, this is brilliant. I need to check in a minute and see how many questions. Will I just see for a moment? We have 24, so I will look at oh, them in a few God. minutes. But no, but I know we, we've, more, we've more than enough to <laughs> keep going with and I'll, I'll check them in a minute. So yeah, no, keep going, please. Um, so there was a few questions about insomnia and sleep. And I do, I get asked this all the time and it's, it's vicious. It's so unfair when you're like not feeling well. And it's often a time in our lives when we're extremely busy. You know, you're maybe coping with parents and or children or job or school or work or whatever. And then on top of all of this, in the middle of kind of a really busy part of your life, all of a sudden your sleep just kind of packs up and, and leaves the building. Um, so like even women who've had no problem with sleep, and I'm a desperate sleeper, so I'm, you know, I'm screwed in perimenopause, but like a lot of women who've had no issue with sleep, they all of a sudden find that, you know, they're not sleeping normally at all. Typically, it isn't an, a problem with initiating, like falling asleep. It's a problem with staying asleep. So you can fall asleep and then you wake up. It's really disturbed sleep. So there's a couple of factors. One is that's an actual thing. So it's not in your head. You haven't done anything to, to cause us. It. It's caused because of, again, it's a theory, but that the drop in estrogen and the effects that has on your brainstem, which controls how we sleep. Um, there's erratic production again, and even a lack of estrogen seems to trigger an issue with sleep. Um, but it's compounded sometimes by other menopausal symptoms. So things like restless legs would be common going through menopause. Um, sleep apnea can be common and is really underdiagnosed in Ireland. So something to be aware of. Um, uh, generalized, you know, aches and pains. And then obviously those urinary symptoms, if you're getting up at night to pee when you never had to before, it's going to disturb your sleep. And hot flushes would be the big one. So night sweats, you're, you know, you're, like I said, covers on and off, on and off. You're changing your jammies, you're, you know. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm smiling because I didn't know about the perimenopause when I was going through it. And when I read all the symptoms afterwards, I thought, oh my gosh. And yet in some way it would have made it easier because, you know, you were saying things there. I thought, yeah, I can tick off. I had that or I had that or I had yeah. that. And I didn't know. And I mean, I remember once um, I, I shared this when we were talking a few weeks ago, Quiva, but I was in um, a, an A&E waiting for someone and there was a man sitting beside me and I could feel a, an insect had fallen down my shirt. And I thought, oh, and I was trying to get it out without anybody seeing it, you know, and it kind of like, what's my hand doing there? 
And, um, and I said it to a friend, to somebody who's a doctor, and he laughed and he said, Google formication. Mm. And I said, what? And I thought he was saying fornication, but it wasn't, it was formication. <laughs> I'd never heard of that. And when I Googled it, I thought, oh, for goodness sake, this is the menopause too. And it was um, the sensation of insects crawling. And I thought, how come we didn't know all of this? So do you think ignorance is bliss? Or do you think we're actually, you know, uh, young well, women coming along are so much better to know this? Maybe ignorance is bliss. Like maybe it's good. I mean, it, maybe it's good to not know these things, but I, no, I would think it's probably better to be informed. I think a lot of reassurance is gained by just knowing what's happening. Even if I'm saying to someone, look, this is a difficult symptom to treat and hormone therapy or whatever else we have at our disposal doesn't reliably treat it. But I can explain to you why it's happening to you and what it is and why you don't need to be concerned. Yes. And I can also explain like statistically what's likely to happen like this is going to last for this amount of time or whatever and you give someone I suppose you just arm them with that knowledge and those tools are really handy I think yeah and and so some of it is it's so disconcerting I suppose in perimenopause to just essentially have it's like puberty where you know you, you look at a teenager going through puberty and they visibly change from the beginning of puberty to the end of puberty they are now living in a different body and the same thing happens with perimenopause you are your body is changing and that's extremely disconcerting I've been living in this body for however long and now I feel I'm waking up in a different body and weight gain I suppose is something to kind of not omit because um it again is something I get asked about so frequently well, if you talk about weight gain, and I am listening, but I'm going to actually look at some of the questions as well. Okay. <laughs> so you talk away about weight gain for a minute. Yeah, so weight gain is a tricky one, um, because, and it happens to almost everyone. So almost everybody going through uh, aging in general is going to be um, predisposed or kind of, you know, heading that direction of weight gain. It happens to everyone. Um, but some hormonal changes happen as you go through um, perimenopause and menopause that change how we gain weight. So one is that you get a change in your metabolic set point. So um, basically, if you're doing, you know, same number of calories per day, same amount of exercise, you've changed nothing, but all of a sudden your weight might be creeping up. Um, and that's a sort of, that's an interplay of some genetic factors and different hormones that your brain produces that drive how we feel hungry and how full we are and different things like that. Um, equally with the hormonal changes that happen in menopause, we get a, a distribution of our waist that's different. So instead of gaining weight on our legs and our thighs and our bum, like you might've done previously, all of a sudden you might find it's all across your tummy, um, which is um, again, distressing. I think for a lot of women, like they feel the clothes that used to fit me or suit me don't anymore. And again, it's like, I look in the mirror, I'm, like, I'm looking at a different person. And I think we underestimate how distressing that can be to have your body just sort of like, you know, the rug pulled out from underneath and, and your, and your body is totally changed. Um, and in terms of what you can do about weight gain, um, I think the biggest message I try to get across to people is that it isn't their fault um, and that they haven't done anything to cause this and that they aren't doing anything wrong by and large. So most people I talk to are aware of, you know, healthy diet and, you know, the recommended amount of exercise and all that kind of thing. And they're, and they're doing that and they're doing their best within what's sustainable for them. So even just taking off some of that guilt can be handy. There's a small bit of evidence to say that hormone therapy can help with that redistribution. So if you want to wade into the kind of science of it, essentially that weight that you put across your tummy, those type of cells that go across your tummy, those type of fat cells, they produce a particular type of estrogen for you. Um, and so where you're not really making estrogen anywhere else except your adrenal glands, which are up on top of your kidneys. So when your body realizes, God, I'm running out of estrogen, my ovaries aren't doing much, it starts to put weight across your abdomen or your tummy because that's active. That type of weight gain produces a really small amount of estrogen for you. Um, so like, love your body. It's, it's, try, it's trying to help. It's just not doing it the way you want to do it. That's all. So look, talk to your GP, talk to someone, make some lifestyle changes, go from there is what I would say. Okay. And actually what you've just said, I think is so important in terms of the response to the questions we've been getting as well, because I was flicking through and in my head was going, Claire, you need to listen to this. <laughs> when you were saying about the weight across your tummy, I thought, ah, I want to hear this as well. It's looking at the questions, <laughs> but the questions and Jamie is working with this as well from aware and she's, she's um, compiling them. So I got a message from Jamie and there's a lot of questions about panic attacks, Quibe, and also questions about you know, people know the symptoms are like me, they didn't know them, but they're, they're discovering them, but what do they do? 
and you know there's a huge I think there's a lot of confusion about HRT and some people are saying they're you know in their 50s they didn't have it is it too early they're on it it didn't work they had their ovaries removed should they have had it should they not and I know there's specific questions that you know that you can't answer but in general terms how, what do you recommend for women to for for each of us to get through this period in a way mm. that you know we're saying and, and I can talk about you know the depression piece and the anxiety piece and in, in a little while but I, I really want your expertise to come through I, from my perspective I suppose I usually break it down into kind of into lifestyle into hormonal treatments and non-hormonal treatments right. and lifestyle again I mean most people know about Mediterranean diet and you know being conscious of doing aerobic exercise weight-bearing exercise because Two, I suppose two of the big issues that we see, two of the big health issues that we might see going through menopause are an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So that's, you imagine like women and men are kind of bobbing along like this, and then women start to meet men's risk, the same level of cardiovascular risk. When we go through menopause, we come up to where the male sort of cardiovascular risk level is because of that loss of estrogen, which is so protective. So your heart health is so important and your bone health is important. You lose your estrogen and a knock on effect, unfortunately, is that we lose bone density at a rate of about 2% per year. It's really significant. And like 50% of women get osteoporosis and it's grossly underdiagnosed and it's a huge cause of mortality and morbidity. So um, I'm sort of singing from the rooftops about like, we, you know, we can't ignore osteoporosis. So it's so important. Did you so, say mort mort mortality with osteoporosis? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a risk if you have a hip fracture and you're over the age of 65, like there's a fairly significant risk of mortality associated with that, whether it's due to surgery or and it would, not to frighten people. I mean, look, yeah. but, you know, there's a huge amount of people walking around with osteoporosis undiagnosed and they're fine and they will stay fine. Okay. It's just to be aware of us that it's, you know, um, because it's it's maybe not completely preventable, but it's certainly a manageable risk. So vitamin D, weight bearing exercise and an adequate amount of calcium in your diet um, from really from perimenopause, from your kind of mid 40s onwards will help protect you. And then some women might need to get a DEXA or a bone density scan. So we do that to screen people for a loss of bone density. Um, and then in terms of hormone therapy and non-hormonal therapy, we talk through the benefits and risks of kind of both of those options. For anxiety and mood, like there's definitely a link. There's been a huge amount of research and study gone into looking at why there is this link. And again, there's all these theories and really it, most of it comes down to the impact that estrogen has on how your brain functions. And like you could go into the science of like verbal fluency and memory and cognitive function and mood and all this stuff. And, and we know like you can visibly see it on a PET scan that someone's brain changes from pre-menopause to post-menopause. Uh, I think telling someone, look, again, a bit like I was saying about weight, this isn't your fault. You aren't imagining it. This is documented. I know why this is happening to you. Um, now, obviously, you can have depression and anxiety superimposed on, you know, you can have those um, conditions that are happening in addition to, you know, in someone who is perimenopausal or menopausal. And it's not the menopause that's causing us. Yeah. And so that takes quite a lot of teasing out. I'll often do a PHQ-9 questionnaire. Like I'll, I'll use kind of tools to kind of so help. Can you, just, can you just explain that? I mean, I know what you mean because we use, in a way we use PHQ-9 as well, but just for, for people who aren't familiar with it, what do you mean by that? It's a symptom scale, I suppose, to try and figure out, you know, what degree of impact these symptoms are having on an everyday life. And you get sort of scored on that. You can probably explain it better than I do, but okay. um, and so, you, and so it's kind of, you know, it's a bunch of questions and you get a score at the end of it and then we can kind of help. It helps us. I don't use it as a kind of absolute set in stone. Yeah, it's a, you a don't pa get, patient health questionnaire. So it's the PHQ. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I should have explained that. Yeah. No, that's okay. Um, <laughs> that's, that's too but awesome. like you don't get to the end of it and think, well, that means you have depression and that means you don't. It's yes. a guide to kind of understand the impact that it's having on someone's life. And it's also handy. You can go back and repeat it a few months later and see where, you know, has someone improved or progressed. So, you, you, know, you know the phrase um, that that's become kind of famous. There's three. There were three of us in this relationship. Well, there's three mm -hmm. of us in this conversation. So Jamie has just flagged me again. <laughs> so I just that's okay. What she's saying. So this is great. So she's saying questions relating to libido, painful sex, incontinence, and it might be good to address some of the more taboo topics and how to manage these, as people may be too embarrassed to discuss with the doctor or friends. Okay, let's talk about vaginas in that case and kind of what's going on with them. So. And we, I, we spoke a bit about like what's actually biologically what's happening and some of the symptoms that people might get. 
the biggest take home, like, and we can go through HRT maybe in a second and, and alternatives, but um, vaginal symptoms, they can be treated in isolation. So this is almost, almost nobody who cannot take vaginal estrogen, small subset of women who maybe can't use it, but it's but almost everybody is a candidate for using vaginal estrogen because it's so safe. So usually it's a small little tablet um, on a sort of applicator that you insert every night for two weeks. And then generally it's twice a week after that. There's a vaginal estrogen cream that we can use as well if someone is getting external symptoms. That was one of the questions I think about having symptoms on the outside. Um, and there's a pessary, a bit like people might be familiar with Caniston pessary, same source of ideas as a pessary. So they all release estrogen. Your vaginal tissue absorbs that estrogen and hopefully the tone of the tissue improves, you get more lubrication, it's not as dry um, and the blood supply starts to come back and things sort of change. And you can safely use that from when you start having symptoms until the day that you die. Like you should be buried with your vaginal estrogen because as soon as you stop it, you're going to go backwards. Um, and so little of that vaginal estrogen actually gets absorbed into your system. They did a study in the States where they got women to use vaginal estrogen um, all the time and they studied their estrogen levels in their blood before they ever were on anything and then after I can't remember how long they were on it three months or four months and there was no difference so they're not you're not really absorbing it into your system so there's no so, side effects then per se is that, is that what you mean there's local side effects sometimes some of the like the pessary or the tablet might be a bit irritating to the local tissue but no like even in women with a history of breast cancer vaginal estrogen is safe and it can improve incontinence hugely as well. Like even if your urine symptoms are mild, it might be all you need is to use vaginal estrogen. It makes sex so much more comfortable and it can make even cervical smears a huge amount more comfortable as well. A lot of women put off cervical smears. It's so painful. You know, I never had a problem, hit menopause, period stopped, went in for my smear. It was excruciating. I'm not going back. It was so uncomfortable. And all they need is vaginal estrogen, even just for a few weeks. And they might find it a lot more tolerable. Yeah. In terms of libido and sex, just before we move on, because I get asked that all the time as well. So really common. Um, I used to do a questionnaire and we'd get people to kind of tick off their symptoms. And I would tell most people, you know, we'd get to the kind of vaginal, you know, genital urinary symptoms of menopause area and libido was there and they would tick that off. And they'd often look sort of bashful, like, you know, do we have to talk about this? Or like they're embarrassed or, um, and I would tell them, look, honestly, 80%, 90% of women are ticking severe for a drop in their libido it is so so common um however it doesn't affect everyone the same degree like one person might not care that they have a drop in libido and for the next person it could be devastating to them and their relationship or you know so it affects everyone a bit differently but really common and it can be treated so um we talk about using testosterone so if you go back to the very beginning and your ovaries produce those three hormones estrogen progesterone testosterone when you get to menopause, estrogen and progesterone start doing this. They sort of have a bit of a nosedive. Testosterone you start losing from your early 30s, um, but it's really, 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 really gradual. So it never does the kind of big dive. But for some women, for whatever reason, and maybe genetic, they get a bigger fall off in testosterone. And they really benefit from replacing that testosterone. It's a gel. You apply it once a day. It can really help with low libido. Um, surgical menopause, if women have had their ovaries removed or you've had chemotherapy or you've had a sort of medically induced menopause, they often benefit from testosterone more than women who've gone through natural menopause as well, just to be aware of that. Okay. Uh, look, this is fascinating, Craig, and I'm so glad it's recorded because we can went, watch back. And I was just going to ask about HRT, but Jamie has just come back again. Oh yes, the same question. So alternatives to HRT, but maybe if you could just explain a little bit about HRT, the pros and the yeah. cons, hmm. and then the alternatives, please. Okay, I'll grab my, I'm sitting in my office, so I have my little dummy gel here so I can show you that as well okay. So, okay. so hormone therapy um is a it's usually a combination of estrogen and progesterone so the estrogen we give because that's the bit that's going to actually make your symptoms better generally speaking um and it can reduce long term it can reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease osteoporosis like we discussed can even be um shown or has been shown to reduce the risk of diabetes and potentially improve um your risk of dementia possibly um, so it has all these potential benefits um, so that's why you take your estrogen. And then secondly, you take progesterone and you take progesterone to protect the lining of your womb. So if you've had a hysterectomy and you don't have a womb, you take estrogen alone for the most part. If you still have your womb, you take the two hormones together, because if I just give you estrogen, you're going to end up with a very thick lining in your womb. Estrogen is like fertilizer for your lining in your womb. 
and that can lead to abnormalities and bleeding and, and abnormal cells long term. We give you the two hormones together. And if you go back to kind of where this whole like taboo and the kind of fear of HRT came from, it was from back in the early 2000s. Uh, there was a, a study called the Women's Health Initiative and they studied estrogen and progesterone. They studied synthetic estrogen. So this is estrogen derived from pregnant mares urine so like horses urine and they studied um a, a progestin called medoxy progesterone acid as a horrible synthetic progestin and they gave it to women on average in, who were in their early to mid 60s that was the average age of women starting hrt in that study and what they showed was there was an increased risk of breast cancer and an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in women who took the two hormones together right. but what has changed is that number one we prescribe different hormones now so Usually your estrogen is body identical. So the type of estrogen I prescribe, if you, if you put it under a microscope, it looks the same as the type of estrogen. If I took it out of your ovary and stuck that under a microscope, you can't tell them apart. They're the same. Um, and it's safer for that reason. Secondly, most estrogen nowadays is prescribed through your skin. The, the patches, which people might be familiar with. Um, I like the gel personally, uh, which comes in, sorry, itchy nose. Okay, which comes in a bottle like so. So you do a, squeeze you get a big like blob of gel and then that goes on the outside of your arm and you sort of smooth it onto your arm that dries in over a couple of minutes and you do that once a day and the difference is oral estrogen so your tablet form of estrogen is going to be broken down and metabolized by your liver and that creates other problems one of which is an increased risk of clotting so that's where your risk of blood clots and stroke comes from small but it's there um, and certainly if anybody smokes or if you have, you know, a body mass index of 30, if you have a history of clots, you're not a candidate for oral estrogen, but you can take dermal estrogen. So estrogen through your skin doesn't go near your liver, doesn't have an impact on clotting, no increased risk of clotting with that. That's your estrogen. Okay. And then your second hormone, your progestin, you can take in a load of different ways. Some people might find it helpful to use a coil. So there's a lot of questions about contraception. Um, so if you're still, basically, if you've, if you're under 50 and you're still having periods, sorry, if you're any age and you're still having periods, you need to factor in contraception. If you're under 50 and it's been more than two years since your last period, you don't need to worry about birth control. If you're over 50 and it's been more than a year since your last period, you don't need to factor in birth control. Okay. If you have very heavy periods, the coil is a great, the coil is a little T-shaped device inserted into your womb, releases progesterone, and it can act as the progesterone part protecting your womb that progesterone part of your hrt and it lasts for five years but it'll improve your bleeding and it potentially and it gives you birth control so it's handy <coughs> sorry and no you had said you your your voice is um hoarse so we're, <laughs> we're just really draining you i'm glad you have some water there so then yeah, yeah. alternatives to hrt so alternatives would be like there's, there's dietary sources of estrogen so if people really want to go down the kind of non-medication route you can try that so they're called phytoestrogen <coughs> or isoflavones things like tofu soya lentils oh. even some of the supplements that you can buy over the counter in the pharmacy they're often they contain phytoestrogens they can be helpful research-wise they've been shown to have some impact in a positive way they're probably not helpful enough for most women as in it just doesn't cut us for most women Okay. And there's a small subset of women who don't have the right, who don't have an, the enzyme you need to turn the phytoestrogen that you're getting from the from your diet into usable estrogen. And that's more common in a Western society. So people of kind of, you know, European descent might be less likely to have the enzyme to make the anyway. So um, so try them is what I would say. <coughs> Quite low risk. If you feel you get benefit, great. Okay. And then if not, the non-hormonal alternatives to HRT, so I talk about CBT a lot, especially since we touched on mood and anxiety. Yeah. So cognitive okay. behavioral therapy, hugely beneficial. Do, do, you, do you want to take a break for a few moments and just take yes. a drink and let me talk about CBT then? Okay, yes, please. That would be, that would be great. Yeah, okay, because yeah. <laughs> okay, I just love CBT. You love talking about the menopause, I love talking about CBT. Okay, so for people who don't know about it, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, thoughts, feelings, actions. So how we'd apply it to perimenopause, menopause. So women we might have thoughts like, um, what's wrong with me? Am I going mad? Am I going crazy? Does everybody think I'm going mad? Does everybody think I'm going crazy? Is this going to last forever? 
oh my gosh, the people notice my flushes, they don't. Um, I'm going to the toilet too often, they'll notice people are paying attention. Um, I don't like this, sleeping at night, why am I waking up? Why should we go to sleep? So all of these kind of very harsh, judgmental, upsetting, questioning thoughts. And then they can trigger us to feel upset and worried and anxious and um, guilty and scared. And um, then in terms of action, so we've thoughts, feelings, and then action. So in terms of action, we can, just as you've been describing, Priva, we can blame ourselves, we can be noticing our tummies, we can be comparing how we used to be to how we are now. We can be comparing how we are to how we think we should be or how other people are. We can be blaming everybody we can be massively blaming you know menopause we can be cranky then we can be apologizing because we're cranky then we can be wishing we weren't the way we were and we can be having thoughts like this is going to go on forever we can be looking for something to make us feel better and and around and around it goes so cbt cognitive behavioral therapy helps us understand what we're thinking how we're feeling what we're doing and separating it out so there's our thoughts there's our feelings and there's our actions and then helps us look at actually our feelings make do our feelings make sense so from everything you've described all those symptoms if we as women were going wow isn't this brilliant <laughs> there'd be something wrong so it makes sense for us to feel worried concerned anxious particularly if people are experiencing panic attacks for the first time and or experience i don't even use that term experiencing anxiety for the first time or are feeling very very down um, women who've had a history of experiencing anxiety or depression over the years might be finding it even worse in menopause because they're thinking, oh God, no, or women who've had migraines or, or whatever. So beginning to recognize it makes sense to feel however we feel. And then catching our thoughts, managing them, and then challenging them. And the way I think it's the easiest to do that is literally to decide, is the thought helpful? And if it's helpful, fine. And if it's unhelpful, well then, we, you know, we can't get rid of it from our heads, but we can shrink it, we can make it small, we can distract it, um, we can just label it as unhelpful. Mm -hmm. Just like we had somebody advising us in a particular type of shoes, and thank you very much, that's your opinion, but I actually like this. So your opinion is your opinion, it's not helpful. So a lot of our thoughts can be unhelpful. Then looking at what we believe, and it's interesting in terms of beliefs about menopause, because some women might believe it's their fault, or they're not good enough, or nobody understands, or they're being punished, or there's no end to it. But from how you've described Kriva, having a belief that actually this is normal. This is as normal as puberty. This, is, this comes with being human, being a woman, and really something to celebrate. So challenging whatever beliefs we have around it, and particularly if we have a belief that it's not our fault. And then action. And this is what, you know, what you're saying is so important. What can we actually do? So we can have all these unhelpful actions about blaming ourselves and others and taking it personally and, and so on. Or we can as well, and we can look at what can we do that's helpful. And what I'm finding incredibly helpful is getting the information, the facts, and knowing that we have choices. So there are mm -hmm. options there. There are people like you who've specialized in the area of menopause. We're not going mad. And then pulling that together, A, B, C, coping sentence, A, acknowledge, I feel upset. B, because I think I'm only 29, <laughs> if any 29 is listening, and this is all ahead of me. Or I feel angry because I'm 72 and I didn't know about this. Mm -hmm. So I am acknowledging because, and then C, choose. But I choose to take really good care of myself. But I choose to get the appropriate help now. But I choose to act in a way that works for me. Um, but I choose to really manage and my own stress levels. I choose to get help for depression, anxiety, and AWARE is a wonderful resource for people with depression. Okay, <laughs> so back to you. That's brilliant. It's great. Like, I, I find that fascinating. Thank you for that. That's brilliant to kind of hear it laid out. I've always struggled to explain CBT, if I'm honest, and I've done it. I think it's great. So that's, it's, yeah, I, I understand it even better now. Thank you for that, yeah. Um, um, so um, in terms of, so I, I, like if, if we're kind of looking at the medical options that go alongside, and I think CBT is something that can work so wonderfully besides, mm -hmm. you know, other, it doesn't have to be you're choosing one route over another. Like um, I get asked a lot about risk with hormone therapy and people are often terrified of breast cancer risk and, and, and different things. So I think it's just really important before I kind of forget to say it. In terms of breast cancer risk, with modern HRT, it's really low. And actually, if you've had a hysterectomy and you're using estrogen alone, the risk of breast cancer is almost not there. Like it's neutral risk or possibly reduced risk, which blows people's minds because we never talk about that. 
Um, that's not publicized, but that's that's where the data is. Um, and so can you just repeat what you just said? Yeah, so if you take estrogen only HRT, so if you've had your womb removed and so you don't need the combination of the two and you just need your estrogen, Mm -hmm. The WH, the Women's Health Initiative showed there was actually a reduction in breast cancer risk in women who were taking estrogen alone. Um, but I think it's fair enough, like you could be confident saying there's no increased risk with that type of HRT. With the combination, when we're using modern type of hormone therapy, so if you're using body identical progesterone, so body identical estrogen and body identical progesterone, and there's a couple of other progestins that are also low risk. We think the risk is somewhere in the region of maybe four to six extra breast cancers diagnosed out of a thousand women after five years of HRT use. And that's very similar to the risk we would see if someone started having, you know, a large glass or a couple of small glasses of wine with their dinner every evening after five years, same inc increased risk of breast cancer with us. And you see a bigger increased breast cancer risk with other things like smoking or you know, um, being inactive, like not exercising frequently and a host of other things, genetics and family history and all these other things that feed into risk. But I just think it's about kind of putting it into perspective and yeah. weighing it up and the cardiovascular risk I'd mentioned earlier. So what they showed in, again, in that big study and then they've kind of confirmed it since is that if you start hormone therapy within 10 years of your last period, so under the age of 60, ideally, and within 10 years of your last period, you get a reduction in cardiovascular risk not an increase. So there's a concept of this window of opportunity. Kareem, I've, I've heard some of my friends say um, they don't want to take HRT because it's a natural menopause, a natural process. And if you take it, it's only prolonging, like it's only kind of pushing whatever the symptoms are so that when you come off it, you're going to hit it like a, um, it, it'll, like a whammy. What, have you, you've obviously heard that before too, I would think. Yeah, no, not true. Like, re and there's no sort of gray area with that. That just isn't true. Um, what can happen is you start your hormone therapy and it is essentially treating the symptoms you're having. You feel great. You stop it and your symptoms come back. But then you were always going to have those symptoms at that time, regardless of taking HRT or not. So you're in that whatever percentage that was going to have symptoms at that time in your life. For most women, they take hormone therapy and we reassess it on an annual basis. And lots of women will take a break to see you know, I'll stop it for a couple of months, see how I feel, see do my symptoms come back. And to be honest, after a few years, for most women, the symptoms don't come back because they're now gone. It's just, if you think about it, your body is kind of reacting to this kind of thing that's going on in perimenopause, then this sort of nosedive that happens as you hit menopause. It takes a few years for your body to adapt to this new environment of low estrogen. And when we give you hormone therapy, you imagine you were living up here in your kind of perimenopausal years or so on, or your reproductive years and you've kind of a fair amount of estrogen and now you're living down here when i prescribe hormone therapy we're bringing you to here like it's not back to here and so you're inevitably going to have this big fall off effect again the, the amount the dose of estrogen we use in hormone therapy is really small even compared to like generally speaking even compared to physiological levels so we're only increasing you a tiny bit we're almost buffering this kind of step down and so when so you come off hormone therapy you should be okay should be okay. Okay, so yeah. I'm just conscious we have 83 questions, and there's no way I can I can read them and have a conversation with you. But I'm trusting that Jamie is reading them, and actually here <laughs> she comes. That's her cue. And um, so she's just saying to um, yeah, re look, we can't address questions that are really specific to an individual's medical history, and that we encourage to talk to a GP or menopause specialist. You know, absolutely. But just we have about five minutes left in terms of this conversation and then i'll wrap up and introduce next next month's webinar so Quiva, in in five minutes that we've left what would you really like people who are participating in this webinar to get from it please i think what's been shown this week in particular um for a lot of women is that the message is really that you're not alone um that i think menopause because it is such a varied spectrum of symptoms so like my you know my menopausal symptoms might be different to my neighbor's menopausal symptoms and and people find it hard to get common ground so it can be quite lonely and people start to think and because there wasn't a discussion about this you're almost in your own little cocoon thinking I'm the only one experiencing this maybe I've done something wrong that I'm having these symptoms it's very isolating and very lonely so I think number one is know that you are not alone that it is normal that you have done nothing to cause these symptoms 
Um, and uh, and that that's OK, like this is not nothing to be scared of, but you need to talk to someone. And so number two is get the information. Make sure you get out there, talk to your GP, look online. The Women's Health Concern, which is part of the British Menopause Society, is a great resource that has tons of information for, for patients. Um, you know, talk right, to menopause just, specialists. You just said that again, just for people who, who yeah, didn't so if you, the women's if the women's health concern. So they're the patient arm of the British Menopause Society, and they're basically just it's a website with loads of resources for patients and tons of information. Lisa, it's fantastic. Um, so that would be number two, and number three is like take action. So if you feel you're symptomatic, you know, take a bit of control back. Think about your long term health goals. And don't be afraid to talk to someone like me or your GP. I never push people into HRT. I rarely, you know, it's rarely a, a definite yes or no. It's a discussion about what your own individual goals are for your health and your symptom control. Sometimes it's just information that they want, but, but seek that out. Take some action. Talk to somebody if you're worried um, or if you're concerned. I have one last question. You are absolutely passionate about this and it's so wonderful to meet you and really thank you so much for this personally, as well as on behalf of AWARE and the people who are watching. Why are you so interested in this? What, what drives your passion, if that's okay to ask? It is. I love women's health, I have to say, and I think we've all got friends or family members or personal experiences that, you know, that incorporate menopause or perimenopause. And so I'm sure we all have our own story of kind of personal experiences with that. Um, and but I've always loved women's health. And I, I found it really difficult in Canada. I was doing a lot of women's health. I was getting referrals from other places about other things. And it was always at the end of a consultation. And it was this, you know, by the way, I'm having these symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I just felt this is an area that's being like they feel ashamed of asking about it or they don't think it's an issue. So I just I loved being able to kind of dedicate myself to it. And then to be honest, it's just so gratifying. Like you talk to women and they get the time to actually talk through it. It's fantastic. Yeah, I love it. Well, look, I think it's about five years ago where we had the conversation with my friends. Nobody's talking about menopause. How come nobody is? And it's so wonderful to have you on this conversation today, Cuevas. So, Gurmila Mahagat. And for those of you who are interested, Aware has a series every month. And I know we've got loads of questions. I've gone over 90, I think, at this stage. Yes, exactly at 90. So those of you whose questions haven't been answered, please, please talk to your GPs about them. And our June webinar is just that so we can be balanced <laughs> within AWARE, a conversation with men about men's health. I don't think they might want to talk about the menopause, but maybe they will <laughs> because it impacts on them as well, as we know. So it's on Wednesday, the 9th of June. 2021 at 12 noon and really encourage you to go to aware and gurmila mahagav galera thank you very much thank you so much